Kylon POV The planetary defence system for the Federation's capital world was designed to ward off an orbital bombardment and consisted of state-of-the-art weaponry. This was the most heavily guarded planet in the galaxy, given its political and symbolic importance. With all of their firepower turned against a single ship, there was no way conventional shields could withstand the blast. I feared the humans had bit off more than they could chew. How would the Terran government retaliate for the destruction of their fleet's crown jewel? It was unclear whether they would stick to the concept of a proportional response. An outright declaration of war could be imminent, especially if the Federation fired the first shots. It seemed common sense from my perspective that provocation of the humans was not in our best interest. Earth was signed on to, and in many cases the founder of treaties that prohibited attacks on civilians. But if pushed to the brink, who knew what they were capable of? Just a single nanite bomb dropped against a metropolitan populace. The casualties would number in the millions. Not that I would be around to worry about the consequences. In a few moments, I would be vaporized. Alongside every other occupant of this vessel. Gazing through the flagship's viewport, I saw an azure glow spreading across the lunar surface. That indicated the orbital laser was charging up. It was capable of emitting the same amount of energy as medium-sized star, at least for a few seconds. A hit that powerful would pass through our shields, as though they were non-existent. Any hopes I had of escaping the situation alive evaporated. I thought they would fire the lunar station's plasma railguns, or their guided missiles, as was typically the protocol for a space intrusion. The orbital laser was the capital's last line of defence, which seemed rather overkill for a single vessel. Was there any way to convince Commander Rikoff to turn back? This is suicide. We must stand down or we're all dead. I hated the note of desperation in my voice, which crept higher in pitch as I spoke. You can talk to the Federation later. Work something out. The commander straightened, the glint of bitterness in his eyes. The time for talking is over. We've tried talking for hundreds of years, and look how well that worked out for us. The Federation needs to learn a lesson in humility. Look, I agree that this is an act of war. If I were in your place, I would respond in kind, too. But you need more ships and a solid plan. Our deaths won't achieve anything, I pleaded. He waved a hand dismissively. I'm not planning on dying today, General. We'll be fine. It occurred to me that Rikov either did not grasp the gravity of the threat, or that his recent skirmishes had led to overconfidence. Whatever fortifications the flagship had, there was no way they were designed to be subjected to such extreme forces. Warning! A target lock against this ship has been detected. Estimated time of impact, five seconds, a computerized voice said. I squeezed my eyes shut, waiting for permanent darkness to overtake me. The sound of trilling alarms rang in my ears, and I wondered if it would be the last thing I heard. There was no fear in my mind, just a burning hatred for the fools running the federal government. This loss of life could have been avoided if only the speaker behaved with sensibility. Five, four, three, two, one. My eyes shot open as a jolt passed through the ship, and I nearly lost my balance in its wake. The lights flickered overhead, presumably from power being rerouted to shields, but that was the only side effect of the blast I noticed. There were no fires breaking out on the bridge, no systems knocked offline. Shields at 96%, structural integrity uncompromised, retaliatory action advised, the computer intoned. I couldn't understand how the flagship was still in one piece. That orbital laser was designed to overpower an entire formation, yet it hardly scratched the Terran craft. All it had achieved was a tiny dent to their shield capacity. Humanity's meekness, and why they had hidden their true nature for so long, was more baffling than ever. Their vessels were nigh invincible, and their technology outpaced the Federation's weaponry by centuries. What was it that differentiated humans from other aggressive species? They could rule the galaxy if they so desired, but instead they moralized and mediated. Commander Rikov cleared his throat. That was your most powerful weapon, General. You people need us more than you realize. I... I suppose nothing should surprise me any more, I grumbled. What now? They're going to fire again once the laser is recharged. The human tilted his head as though weighing his options. That station is remotely operated. A sensor scan of the moon detected zero life signatures. Yes, to my knowledge, 
I answered. Good. In that case, we're going to make sure they don't have the chance to fire again. He clapped his hands together, a predatory grin on his face. Ensign Carter, ready the antimatter missiles. I want you to bury that station. Understood, sir, came the reply from the weapons post. I felt strangely detached, watching a trio of warheads close the distance between us and the station. My oath as a soldier was to protect and defend the Federation against all enemies, and it seemed the Terrans could now be classified as a hostile party. After all, without the planetary defense system, the capital would be left vulnerable to attack. By taking no action during this engagement, I was siding with the humans, wasn't I? The missiles slammed into the lunar surface with a radiant flash, churning up plumes of dust and debris. Where a sophisticated defense complex once stood, only three craters remained. The aftermath was reminiscent of an asteroid strike, rather than a missile, given the magnitude of its depth. Staring at the fresh gash in the stony ground, I wondered yet again why the Federation was hell-bent on angering the humans. Creatures with such a mastery of destruction should be appeased, not aggravated, unless your objective was the eradication of your civilization. The low whir of machinery sounded from behind me, and I flinched on instinct. Whipping around, I spotted a robotic cart stocked with firearms wheeling across the bridge, and the Terran personnel gearing up as it passed by. Commander Rikoff withdrew a scoped plasma rifle, and without a word handed it to me. Its weight was much heavier than I expected, and my shoulders sagged as I accepted it. Either the humans were sporting some sort of power armor, or their physical strength greatly exceeded that of my species. General, I think we're going to have to fight our way to embassy once we dock. Between protesters and the Federation security forces we'll be outnumbered, the commander said. You know the layout of the capital better than us. Any suggestions? I paused, tossing a few ideas around my head. Well, a diversion would help. Do you have chemical weapons on the flagship? I assume the protesters are packed close together outside the embassy so you could hit them with some sort of gas attack. When the emergency hovercraft respond to the scene, you can use them as a shield from the special forces. I expected the human to appreciate the resourcefulness of my plan, but instead he was looking at me like I'd grown a fourth eye. His mouth opened and closed a few times, as though he was struggling to find the words. We're not doing that, he replied at last. Please forget I asked. Whatever his problem with my suggestion was, it escaped my comprehension. Not only would it minimize human casualties, but it would also provide cover in a dense urban landscape. A wide open avenue wasn't exactly ideal for ground combat and maneuvering. The flagship began a rapid descent through the planet's atmosphere, hurtling past silvery clouds. The computer's display stated that it had locked onto the landing beacon, and I steeled myself to face whatever lie ahead. As we neared our destination, I finally caught a glimpse of the ground below on screen. I had known that we would likely need to fight our way out of the spaceport before we could head toward the embassy. It came as no surprise then, when I spotted the contingent of soldiers filing into the hangar bay, weapons ready. However, I had not been expecting them to number in the hundreds, and to be solely comprised of Zanuck servicemen. This was no ordinary security force, and that could make our mission more difficult than expected. I just hoped Commander Rikoff had a plan, because against a unit of that size, I didn't have the slightest idea how to escape the spaceport alive. Keelon POV Commander Rikoff's orders had been not to engage the Zanuck soldiers unless they shot first, but I had expected them to open fire as soon as we exited the flagship. Instead they were milling about the spacious terminal, guns pointed at the tiled floor rather than at us. One individual immediately caught my eye. His striking dark blue feathers and pronounced beak suggested he was of noble lineage. Unlike the others, he was wearing his dress uniform rather than combat gear. I could have sworn I'd seen him in the media, though I couldn't quite place him. Was he some politician or general? If so, what in the stars was he doing out in the field? The human commander followed my gaze, and recognition flashed through his eyes as he spotted the Zanuck nobleman. At ease! Ambassador Kazil, what is this? The Terran soldiers flanking us dropped back at the new orders, relaxing their stance. I stared in disbelief at Ambassador Kazil. Planetary ambassadors were only present at events of major significance, and for most Federation species, they were considered the highest-ranking dignitaries in their government. An ambassador accompanying a security detail to a hostile confrontation? 
That was simply unheard of. Kazil chuckled, a low rumbling sound. You want to get to the Terran embassy, yes? I think my personal security detail will be a sufficient escort. You're not here to stop us? Rikoff asked, raising an eyebrow sceptically. Of course not. Earth is our largest foreign creditor, and also a major trading partner. It would cripple our economy for decades to go to war with you, the ambassador replied. The human shook his head, a smirk on his face. Let me get this straight. You're helping us, not because we're allies or because the Federation's behavior is unjust, but for money. Exactly. I see why our governments get along so well. A note of amusement punctuated the commander's words. You do realize that the Federation could go to war with you for helping us, don't you? War? With what army? If we leave, the other military species will follow. Kazil stretched a talon toward me. It seems you've already won over the Jatari anyways. You've turned the highest-ranking Federation general into your errand boy. My blood burned at the insult, and I raised my plasma rifle at the ambassador's head. Errand boy? I dare you to say that again. Commander Rikoff reached over, prying the weapon from my grasp. General, I would appreciate if you didn't shoot our only ally in the Senate. I clenched my teeth, feeling the veins bulge in my neck. Was the commander really taking his side? Assaulting the Zanuck ambassador wouldn't be the smartest move, especially while surrounded by his soldiers, but his haughty attitude was insufferable. Yes, you should listen to the human, Kazil said, a triumphant look in his eyes. Rikoff wagged a finger at the ambassador. Don't look so smug. You're out of line too, trying to get under a Jatari skin. The general and I both have a score to settle with a certain someone. He is not my subordinate. Relax. I was just having a bit of fun. The Jatari are wound way too tight, he responded. Who is this certain someone? Well, our business with her is unofficial, if you understand what I mean. Rikov traced a hand down the barrel of my confiscated rifle, a dark look on his face. We want to track down Speaker Ula. That Duzai. I wasn't too familiar with Zanuck profanity, but I believe Duzai loosely translates to intestine brain. She shouldn't be hard to find. Ula's on the Senate floor as we speak, raising a motion for the Terran Union's removal from the Federation. The Senate is in session now and you're not there, I grumbled. I had better things to do. Kazil looked at me for a moment, then turned his gaze back to the commander. Frankly, I don't know why Ambassador Johnson attended. I guess she likes listening to grandstanding idiots. Rikoff laughed. It probably reminds her of home. In all seriousness, though, do you think the motion will pass? Does Ula have the votes? The ambassador hesitated. I don't know. There's a lot of representatives on the fence, but your attack on the capital probably tips the scales in the speaker's favor. Our attack? The Federation fired the first shots, the commander protested. It doesn't matter. That's not how Ula will tell it. Kazil glanced at his holopad, avoiding the human's gaze. Enough chit-chat. We should start off toward the embassy. Rikov nodded and handed me back my firearm. Our posse trailed behind the Zanuck security detail as we exited the spaceport in a brisk fashion. A few humans stayed behind on the flagship to guard it, and if necessary, lift off to avoid its capture. But most of the crew had disembarked for this mission. I assumed for most of the humans, this would be their first time seeing the capital in person. Even after hundreds of visits, I still found the city-state a sight to behold. In the emerald glow of the setting sun, the capital's architecture took on an ethereal quality. On the horizon rested the Hall of Governance, an intricate blue spheroid that housed the Senate and the Military Command Center. The rest of the buildings encircled the Hall. All Federation species were given a stretch of land, with the founding members' territory nestled in the inner ring. Embassies were often wedged between shops and cultural sites, giving each region of the city a distinct flair. The Terran's Corner was famed for its street vendors and nightlife, but today the market stalls were abandoned. A crowd of non-human protesters, numbering in the thousands, packed the street. The mob seemed agitated. Barricades lined the avenue to thwart their advance on the embassy. A wall of human police camped behind the barriers, pushing back any demonstrators who tried to cross the threshold. I say police in quotation marks, because they were dressed head to toe in black combat gear, an outfit identical to that of a Terran soldier. The only path to the embassy was through the throng, and a few of the protesters had already noticed our presence. 
A group of them splintered off and charged toward us, wielding blunt weapons and makeshift projectiles. It was evident that we needed to get the demonstrators out of our way, or they would overwhelm us with sheer numbers. The same thought must have crossed Ambassador Kazil's mind, because with a whistle he signalled for his men to drop into a firing position. The Zanuck soldiers found a target, talons hovering over their trigger. Stop! What is wrong with you people? Rikov shrieked, sounding almost hysterical. I offered him a sympathetic smile. There's no other way. Ambassador Kazil gestured agreement, looking baffled by the human's outburst. The commander wordlessly removed the silencer from his rifle, paying no mind to approaching civilians. He aimed the barrel at the sky and fired three times in quick succession. I winced at the unmistakable ear-splitting pops. The protesters descending on our position scrambled backward, and I heard screams from the crowd. The humans are shooting at us! one voice shouted. In a matter of seconds the demonstrators dispersed, running for their lives. They scattered off into alleyways and storefronts, clearing the path for our unit. Commander Rikov sighed, lowering his weapon. There's always another way. A knot of shame settled in my stomach. If not for the commander, I would have stood by and watched a needless civilian massacre. Speaker Euler really could not have been more wrong about his species, that much was obvious. The humans had no desire for death, and their first thought was always toward limiting casualties. Whatever bloodshed littered their history, they had changed. One of the police officers broke from his formation, marching down the street. He pushed his way past the Zanuck soldiers, pointing an accusatory finger at Rikov. Why are you here? I told Terran Command not to let you come. The commander gasped, staring slack-jawed at the stranger. Pavel? I thought you were a hostage. The agency has ways in and out of the embassy. Pavel unclasped his helmet, revealing a face that looked like a younger version of Rikov. It really isn't good if any of us are captured. What is the agency? I demanded. This is your brother. Commander Rikov waved a hand dismissively. The State Department, I told you. And yes, this is my brother. Pavel, this is... Pavel smirked. I know, General Kilon, an honor. And unless I'm hallucinating, the Zanuck ambassador is in your little band as well. We're at your service. On behalf of my government, we apologize for the Federation's recent actions, Kazil said. No need. Since you're here, you guys might as well help. Rikov's brother gestured toward the embassy. I have a plan to sneak some hostages out of maintenance tunnel, but it needs a distraction. I couldn't shake the feeling that Pavel was more than just a State Department employee, though I decided not to express my doubts. What common diplomat would suit up with a militarized police force? Or be drawing up tactical plans to rescue hostages? It was a relief that the commander's brother was safe, but something told me I needed to watch him very closely. I forced a smile, trying to act normal. We can do that. Just let us know what you had in mind. Euler POV I glanced at my note cards one last time as I stepped to the lectern. There was a strange sense of giddiness fluttering in my heart. With the Terran flagship firing on our sacred capital, the evidence of human treachery was now apparent. The most worrying part was how easily our trillion credit defense system had been obliterated. If that ship was here to conquer us, of course, there would be little Federation forces could do to stop them. But given how humanity liked to present itself as a docile, peaceful race on the galactic stage, it seemed more likely they would attempt to salvage the optics of their attack. We needed to end our association with the Terran Union, while we still had that option. Senators, friends, I come to you today with grave news. I paused, my gaze sweeping across the packed auditorium. It seemed that all of the representatives were present, barring the empty seat reserved for the Zanuck ambassador. Our capital defences were savagely bombed by an invading Terran ship, which is deploying ground troops as we speak. For anyone who believed long-term partnership with humanity was possible, you can now see that their intentions are anything but benevolent. Jatari Ambassador Palam rose to his feet, looking annoyed. If you poke a Garrett, eventually it will bite. You would destroy the Federation, thrust us into a war to prove a point. Madam Speaker, remember that you brought this upon yourself. Leave it to the military species to jump to humanity's defense. Their brains were both wired for aggression, so no wonder they understood each other. Palam's analogy was unfitting, unless his implication was that humans were not sapient. 
garrets were a non-sentient predator species indigenous to the Jatari homeworld that had been domesticated to herd cattle. If I didn't know better, I would say that sounds like a threat, I hissed. This is not about proving a point. This is about a bloodthirsty species that has weapons that pose an existential threat to our society. If raising legitimate concerns about humanity and trying to distance ourselves from them is a crime, then I am guilty. The Federation will never throw its lot in with a planet of murderers and liars, not under my watch. Many of the representatives were signalling agreement with their body language as I spoke. The Jatari ambassador appeared to struggle for a response before returning to his seat, shoulders slumped in defeat. While Palam's immediate protest was no surprise, what was shocking was that the human ambassador hadn't said a word. A quick glance in her direction found her leaning forward in her chair, watching me with unblinking eyes. An involuntary shudder went down my spine, and I drew a deep breath to calm myself. If you believe that a species we now know has a history of systemic genocide, bloody wars and tyrannical regimes can change, then you will vote for them to remain in the Federation. I drew closer to the microphone, dropping my voice to a low whisper. All I wanted was for you to see that for all their lies and grand speeches they have not changed. It was always a matter of time before they would turn their sights on us. I was rather taken aback when Ambassador Johnson stood, slowly clapping. Her applause seemed sarcastic in nature, especially with the smirk plastered on her face. I sighed, tapping a hoof with annoyance. Ambassador Johnson, do you have something to say? It is your right to reply, at least while Earth is still a member planet. I have plenty to say, but the question is whether any of you will listen, she replied. First off, the missile launch against your defence station was unauthorised. You're saying your ship went rogue? That's not exactly reassuring, I pointed out. What happens when the next one of your crews decides to go rogue? The human glared at me. You directly provoked a civilian assault on our embassy. And yet you throw stones. Terran government condemns Commander Rikov's actions, but it's a clear case of self-defence. Show the logs from the station's computer, Madam Speaker. You won't, because they show that you fired on the ship first. A series of anxious murmurs rippled across the chamber, and I could tell Ambassador Johnson's words had planted seeds of doubts in some attendees' minds. I considered challenging the notion that our station had fired first, but I suspected she would not make that claim without evidence. If the humans persuaded the representatives that it was a case of self-defence, there was a chance she could sway enough of the votes in her favour. The civilians acted of their own accord. I simply... Outright said humans weren't welcome here? Condoned a race riot? And look, you're not disagreeing that our ship was fired upon. I concede that the orbital laser launched one volley against your vessel, but they were trespassing in our space and refused to leave. You do understand that the highest-ranking general in the Federation was among the passengers, and that ship was tasked with transporting him to the embassy, right? You assaulted a diplomatic rescue mission. Are we really the violent ones? I could sense the balance of the chamber shifting, and I cursed under my breath. Human diplomats were known to have a way with words, and excelled at backing their opponents into a corner. It was a struggle to maintain my composure, faced with such accusatory rhetoric, but I knew if I lost my temper it was equal to defeat. Yes, you are the violent ones. Care to comment on your history? A triumphant smile inched across my face. There was no way the ambassador could defend her species' past actions, which by galactic law could be classified as crimes against sentience. Your so-called world wars and the brutal instances of ethnic cleansing? I've done my research since you launched that nanite bomb. Ambassador Johnson broke eye contact, a troubled frown crossing her lips. We regret those years deeply. Humanity had to learn the hard way that violence is not the answer, and we nearly destroyed ourselves in the process. For all the time you've known us, we have not been that species. I urge you to recall all the good we have done in our history with the Federation, not just the evil of our primitive years. Who accepts the most refugees of any planet each year? Who sends medics to help both sides of a conflict? Who sponsors bills on sentient rights and wrote the galactic laws concerning war crimes? I don't know what else we can do to prove that we are peaceful. You can stop building nanite bombs, for one. We only use those to protect our friends. That's right, even after all this nonsense, we still see you as friends. The time for your games is over, Madam Speaker. 
we have bigger problems on our hands, fighting a homicidal AI. Instead of sabotaging us at every turn, why don't you help us? Calls of assent came from around the hall, and I gritted my teeth in frustration. For every point I made, it seemed the ambassador had a pre-prepared response at the ready. There was no way I could tolerate the Terran Union's presence among us any longer. Humans were despicable creatures. How did the others not see the truth, even after an attack on the capital? As I was trying to think of a response, a panicked Tujili messenger burst into the chamber. Madam Speaker, please forgive me for interrupting, but you weren't answering your holopad. We are under attack. Hundreds of battleships are descending on the capital, and our defences are obviously offline. You! You did this! I screeched, pointing at Ambassador Johnson. I knew it! The human held up her hands defensively, appearing genuinely confused. It's not us, really. What, rogue ships again? Hundreds of them, I sneered. They're not Terran Union ships. In fact, the transponders identify them as ours, the messenger said. Pandemonium erupted among the Senate body, with dozens of representatives shouting questions at once. As far as I was concerned, humanity had to be behind this somehow. Perhaps they had hacked our military craft. I pounded a hoof against the floor, attempting to restore order. Silence! Have the attackers fired on us? Have they broadcast demands? No shots fired yet, but they told us we have one hour to surrender unconditionally, he answered. I glanced back at Ambassador Johnson, trying to gauge her response. She was staring at the empty seat belonging to the Zanuck Republic, as though some revelation had occurred to her. I could have sworn the words she muttered were, Damn it, Kazeel! The human hesitated her gaze sweeping across the chamber. Her eyes stopped on me, and I could see the unspoken question in them. She wanted the satisfaction of hearing me beg for assistance, a grovelling apology. But even if she had been truly unaware of the Zanuck's intentions, surely their assault would force the Terran Union's hand. So, what are you going to do, Ambassador? Seize the chance to take us over? I asked, voice dripping with contempt. Ambassador Johnson snorted. You have a funny way of asking for help. A bitter laugh rumbled in my throat. Why would you help us? Because, as I've been telling you, we're not what you think we are. Now I have a call to make to a certain commander. That invading flagship just might come in handy. She's got quite a few tricks up her sleeve. After a brief moment of hesitation, I gave the ambassador a grudging nod. A human gesture, which was a concession on its own. I didn't trust an offer of assistance from humanity of all species. But under the present circumstances, there was no choice but to accept it. It remained to be seen if the Terran Union would actually confront its greatest ally, but I wouldn't be holding my breath. 